All right, we're going to be in the book of 1 Corinthians today, chapter 12. We're going to look at the first 11 verses. I don't know if I got it put on. I tried to put it on this morning. My phone was acting up, so I don't know if I got it on there or not. But uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the first 11 verses. We're in week one of the sermon series, Off-Grid Living. I thought that was a cool name anyway. I don't know if anybody else does, but I thought that was a cool name. Book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to look at the first 11 verses. I'll give me just a minute. I hear some pages rustling. If you're there, say amen. amen. Okay, all right. Let's see what God's Word has to say, say to us this morning. It says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles, carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse. And no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in, works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one in the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. That just comes to make me, it comes to mind to me. We always got to remember. I don't care, you know, if you're a born again Christian, we are on the same team. We are on the same team. Too many people want to pull different ways because they have a little bit of different way of thinking. We're all on the same team. If the, if the church itself, when I say church, I'm talking about the church, not just, just this church. If we could just get along with ourselves, what could we do? We're all on the same team. And we, and we wonder why uh, we feel the way we do many times. Because, you know what, we, we can't even get along with our own selves. How are we going to impact the world? With everything going on in the world, what do I hear a lot? I hear a lot of people talk about disconnecting from the world. That's why I call this sermon, sermon series Off-Grid Living. Here I'm talking about disconnecting from the world. Anybody who's ever done anything in this life, at times you've had enough of it. You say, I'm done. I don't care what they're going to do, but I'm done. I'm done. I'm done with this stuff. Whatever it is, whatever it is that you want to walk away from, you said, I'm just tired of it. I want to disconnect from the world. Now, I know some of us handle things that come our way better than others. You know, some, some people, you know what, they can have something major going on in their life, and you would never know it. You never hear a peep from them. Oh, but yet there's those others, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? It could be the smallest thing and you thought the world was coming apart. We all handle things differently, but regardless of how we handle them, we all have our moments. We all do. Now, let, let me touch on something real quick that way it kind of makes sense where I'm going with this. Now, the term off-grid, actually, in the world itself, it refers to not being connected to the national electric grid. It also refers to living in a self-sufficient manner without living on public utilities. Now, when I was thinking about that, you know, in a spiritual sense, now that we're talking about in the physical, but in the spiritual sense, their Christians should also be living off-grid. In other words, we've got to think about where we get our power from. You see, uh, if you live off-grid, you're not getting your power source from the uh, from outside source. Now, as a Christian, we shouldn't be getting our power from an outside source either, right? Amen? Amen. Our, our power source should be coming from the Holy Spirit. That's where our power comes from. You're talking about an unlimited resource. You know, and, and I, I don't get a bill for it either. I don't get a bill for it. Believe me, you know, every month, whether you've got the money or not, your electric bill's coming. And you better be able to pay it. 
Because they're going to shut it off on you. I don't have to worry about the bill being paid with, with, with the Holy Spirit because it was already paid for me. The one who paid for that is Jesus. The bill is already paid. You're talking about a power source. Where you get your power from makes all the difference. Where, you, where that source is makes all the difference in the world. We as Christians should not be getting our power from the world. I'd much rather get my power source from, the, from God, the Holy Spirit. Amen? Come on. Amen. Now let's look. Let's look before I go any farther. Now, the, the Apostle Paul here, he's the one that's the, doing the teaching here and, and things and from, from 1 Corinthians. Now, the Corinthians, now they were the people. They lived in the city of Corinth. That's why they call them Corinthians. So let's look at them just for a minute. Because you've got to look who, who the Apostle Paul was talking to and talking about. Otherwise, it doesn't really make any sense. Now, the city of Corinth was a hub of commerce. You know, you, got to have, you have a lot of trade going on. So that means when you got that happening, you know what? Guess what? You're getting all kinds of people coming in there with all kinds of beliefs and all kinds of ways of thinking. It's just all kind of craziness when you've got that many people coming in and out from all over the place. It just happens. I mean, have you ever been to New York City? I mean, I mean there's a, just a lot of craziness going on there. There's all kinds of stuff happening. When I, when, in other words, the city of Corinth, with all that happening, it was a city of degrade and idolatry. I mean, does that sound familiar? You know, I mean, a lot of times we read this stuff in the Bible and you know you can't relate to it. That is just as real as the day. Look at our culture. If that ain't one of the great and idolatry, I don't know what is. Well, what, I, what, what I love is the Apostle Paul, what, what, when he was going in there, see, he's dealing with the church. He established a church there in Corinth. Now, the Corinthian people, they were going through a lot of stuff. The church was going through a lot of stuff. You know, this church was going through a lot of problems and a lot of struggles. Why was that? Because they were coming out of a pagan society. Sound familiar? You wonder why churches struggle? You know, every one of us here today, when we walk out that door, we're going into a culture that's ready to take us apart. Every one of us, I don't care what you got going on, where you live, and how your life is set up, when you go out those doors today, there's a society ready to take you apart. And then when we come back in here, guess what? We still got problems, we still got issues, we got all these things going on in our life. Some of us might put on our happy face and come in here and act like nothing's happening, but it's because of the world we live in. We can't help it. You know, we're going to struggle at times because we get distracted. When we start struggling, we're no longer getting our power from God anymore. We're not getting our power from the Holy Spirit. We're starting to rely on the world again. We're starting to think, I must be wrong. So everybody's telling me I'm wrong. Everybody around me is doing all this. But you know what I mean? It just seems like I'm the wacko here. You know, I'm the weird one. <coughs> Something I'm not fitting in anywhere. Well, you're not going to fit in. If, if you're going to live for God, you're not going to fit in. A lot of the people you used to run with and you, who you used to talk with, guess what? They don't want to talk to you anymore. It's, you know what? When I first got saved, people thought, well, what are you, mad with them? No, I'm not mad with them. I just don't live like that anymore. I'm not mad with them. But I can't do, go around them because I'm going to end up doing those things too. You know, you've got to make some changes. When you're not going to fit in, you know, you're just not going to fit in at times, it's okay. Because at the end of the day, you're going to fit in somewhere else that they ain't. Think about that. The Apostle Paul, I love it. Thank God for the Apostle Paul. I mean, he wrote the biggest part of the New Testament because, I mean, he, he, he teaches us so many things. I love that the Apostle Paul not only disciplines us, but he gives us counsel. You know, a lot of people want to tell you how you're wrong. <laughs> right? Come on. Hey, come, we're not the funeral today. Come on, somebody amen me. I'm going to amen myself here. Amen. I'm going to give myself a high five or something in a minute or something. Yeah, somebody, come on now. The Apostle Paul not only disciplines us, but he gives us counsel. Because there are so many in this world that, that they're going to tell you how you're wrong. But they don't give you any common sense solution. They just want to tell you how you're wrong. It makes them feel better about themselves. I like common sense solutions. Amen. I like the everyday thing. I don't like things complicated. I don't like drama. I don't do, I don't do drama. People wonder why, you know what, I, oh, well, you, you don't want to talk to me in the world and this and that. No, you've got drama with you. I can do without. So thank you. I don't have anything but, uh, against you, but I don't want to be around you because I don't need drama. 
you, you ain't got nobody like that in your life. Amen. <laughs> a part of the counsel that Paul offered was to live by the Spirit. I know that's harder to do than it's easier to say than and it's harder to do. Because sometimes you know what? The old man, as the apostle Paul says, describes it, the old man wants to rear up in us at times and we just want to let him have it. Woo! I get older, he's gotten on my nerves today. <laughs> but you know what? We've got to live by the spirit. Now we all have our moments. I know I know ain't nobody here got no halos. No, not, not one of us. But Paul talks about living by the spirit. He also said for everyone to not for everyone uh, to not only use their gift, but to realize that gifts, all of them, are important. Every one of them. Sometimes we think the gifts that we have are not important. Oh, I, I can't do those things. I, I, my gift, anything that I can do doesn't really matter. It does. What did the video we just watched? What, somebody sent that young man in a shoebox... A bar of soap and a, uh, and a washcloth. How insignificant does that seem to us in America? But it made a difference in someone's life. So to say that uh, your gifts are not important, you know what you're really saying when you say your gifts are not important? You say God got it wrong. That's what you're saying. Oh, I'm not saying that. Yes, you are. You're saying God got it wrong. He gave me the wrong gifts or he didn't give me any gifts. You're saying God got it wrong. God don't get it wrong. I get it wrong, and you get it wrong at times. God don't get it wrong. He gave you specific gifts and a purpose in this life, whether you know it or not. I'm not saying you're using them, but He gave you those things. You might not like the gifts He gave you. You might like somebody else's gift better than yours. Yeah. Amen. But somebody, I'm telling you, God has a purpose and a plan. We've got to remember where our power comes from. That is the Holy Spirit. God, we understand sometimes. Jesus, we love. Oh, we love Jesus in the church. Oh, he forgave me of my sins. But the Holy Spirit, I, I don't know about him. I'm not, I don't want to understand him. I, I don't want no parts of him. Well, you better want some parts of him. Because without the Holy Spirit, you can't even be saved. The Holy Spirit is what draws you. That is what convicted you. You know that conviction you felt about your sin? That was the Holy Spirit. God did that not to punish you, but to try to see your life changed. You better, you better have a part in the Holy Spirit. If you don't want the Holy Spirit, you can't even be saved. The Holy Spirit does a great work in our life. A part of the things that Apostle Paul was trying to teach us, live by the Spirit. Now, how hard is that? It is. It's difficult sometimes. When you live off the grid spiritually... You better remember where your help comes from because you're going to be left empty sooner or later. Because you've got to have a source of power. If you're living on your own ability and your own power to get where you want to be in life, you're eventually going to be left empty. I don't know about you, but anybody, anybody who has never at some point in your life been left, hasn't been left empty, you've never lived. You've never done anything in this life. And everybody at one time has felt empty. Say, God, there's got to be more to life than this. And there is. And there is. I don't know what happened, how, whatever come about, but sometimes at some point in your life you were left empty. We were living for ourselves, or maybe even maybe you were born again, but you got off track somehow, somehow and you forgot where your real help comes from. You forgot where that source of power comes from. The Holy Spirit. That's where that power comes from. When you have that Holy Spirit in your life, you're not going to be empty. <laughs> that, that I'm telling you, you're not going to be empty. The world, let me just say this, the world, talking about the electrical grid, I don't care how big a generator they build, I don't care how big they build the electrical grid, it has limitations. Yes. It's going to have limitations. Yes. Whereas a Christian, our power source, the Holy Spirit, has no limitations. Mm -hmm. The only limitation on the Holy Spirit is how much I yield to it. And that's hard. Because Eddie wants to take control sometimes. Eddie wants to do what Eddie wants to do. I know you all do too. I know everybody's just looking at me and saying, Pastor, you, what? you better look at yourself. You better look in that mirror. You better look in that mirror. It ain't just me. Each and every one of us, we all, some of us are more controlling than others. 
But each one of us have a problem with that sometimes. We, you know, we think we've got this. Yeah, we got it all right. We got it all right. Our power source, we need to remember where it comes from. It's an unlimited source. Talk about a renewable energy source. It, it can be renewed anytime I want it as long as I yield to it. Yielding to anything ain't something we want to do. As I said, uh, I talked about a while ago, the electric bill. Your electric bill is going to come every month. It's only going to be renewed if you pay the bill. That power is going to be cut off if you don't. You see, the bill's already been paid. Thank God for that. It was already paid. Jesus did all the heavy lifting for us. He made it easy for us, even though we make it complicated at times. We all love Jesus. But how about the Holy Spirit? You know the Holy Spirit... We don't really, it's very misunderstood. The Holy Spirit is the third part of the Holy Trinity. But it's very misunderstood. The Holy Spirit is not an it. It's a person. Amen. It's one of the parts of the whole, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I don't care what you want to call them. The Holy Trinity, the Godhead, the triune God, whatever you want to call it, it's all the same thing. The Holy Spirit is just as much God as Jesus and God the Father is. We can't leave him out of the equation. He's an important part. He's the one that draws us. He's the one that does so many things in our life. God the Father is the one that created you. God the Son is the one who gave his life for you. And God the Spirit is what draws us and empowers us. Why do we want to stop with Jesus and not have the Holy Spirit? Don't you want to be empowered? I know I do. Because Eddie runs low at times. Eddie, Eddie can't do it by himself. You know, I need Jesus. I need God. I need the Holy Spirit. Now, many times we, as I say, we don't understand the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of things on this side of eternity that we're not going to understand. And I don't care how much clarity you have and how much wisdom you have and how high your IQ is. There's a lot of things on this side of eternity that you're just not going to understand. The Holy Spirit does more than just clean us up at salvation. Now that was a job. I don't care how holy you are, how good a person you are, that was a job. Think about that. Now some of us, he had to do a whole lot of work there to clean us up. And don't get me wrong, that's not a job in itself. That's a process, that's an ongoing process. Amen. It's a lifetime job, actually. Because none of us have arrived until that day we cross over to the other side. We all got problems. We all got issues. Sometimes we sin. Oh, what, Pastor? Yes, yeah, sometimes we sin. But I still know this. The, the Holy Spirit wants to do something in you, in me, and He wants to do something through us. You see, once He does something in us, He wants to do something through us as well. We forget that many times. I love when God does something in me. Because at times I need something done in me. Mm -hmm. But what about the times when God wants to do something through me? Oh, I'm going to take a few steps back on that one. I'm not so sure I want that. I love what God's doing in my life, but I'm not so sure about that. You're not relying on the Holy Spirit anymore when you, when you act like that. You've got to remember, are you yielding to the Spirit? Or are, you, are you yielding to yourself and allowing you, you to take control? God did not do a great work in your life. You say, what great work? If you're born again, that was a great work. You know, that, that wasn't an easy task that Jesus going to the cross, right? That he went for you, right? That wasn't an easy thing. He did so, God didn't do that great work in your life just so you could keep it to yourself. I'm not telling you to go out and, you know, just hit, hit people over the head with what you believe. But you can't keep what God did to yourself. I've met people who said they were Christians, and if they hadn't have told me, I'd have never known it. All things that we have should be used for the glory of God. All our gifts, all our talents, whatever God has given us. I want to give you a little illustration here. This is how I see it anyway. Now, whenever I go to a festival or an event, I'm hoping they have a car show. I like going to see the old cars and things like that. Really, my, I, like, I love the cars, but... Really, my thing is, I always look for the old trucks. Because there's not that many of them. Them trucks got used. Them really old trucks. 
I mean, they're just wore out. They don't exist. So you ever notice at a car show, there'll only be a couple old trucks usually because they're just wore out. That's what I look for anyway. But have you ever uh, noticed people who own classic cars, they don't treat them like cars. They don't treat them like any car I ever had anyway. That's not how I treated my cars anyway. You know, what do they treat their cars? Have you ever seen them? They sit there in their little lawn chairs behind them and, you know, and you go up and look at them. I love looking at them. They treat those cars not as cars to me. They treat them as trophies. What do you do with a trophy? Shine it up. You know what I mean? Walk, you know, proudly, you know, you shine it up or whatever. And a trophy is something you admire. Say, this is mine. You know, you polish it up and clean it and, you know. But you ever notice many of those classic cars, they only come out on Sundays or if there's an event. How often do you see them on the road? Not much. Not much. The Holy Spirit in someone's life is to be not to be used as a trophy. You're not just supposed to bring it out on Sundays and polish it up and occasionally take it out. That's not the way it works. It's something that needs to be used every day. Does anybody else here see the correlation that I got out there trying to bring together there? You know, I don't know if it made any sense. Sometimes I, I preach something and I think it only made sense to me and nobody else got it. But it, it's all right. Now, I've won one trophy in my entire life. When I was in high school, I won the lightweight division weightlifting. And I still have that trophy today. It sits above my desk on my computer by, at home. But guess what? That trophy don't leave. That trophy stays right there. It doesn't leave. As old as it is, it just sits there. I don't take that trophy out. I don't go anywhere with it. I don't do anything with that. It stays there. The Holy Spirit that we received when we got saved, it must travel with us, not like a trophy. Those classic cars, how often do they go out? Not very often. That trophy, if you've ever won something, how often does it go out? It probably sits on your mantle somewhere if you've ever won anything, a certificate or a trophy or something. It doesn't go anywhere. When we get saved, our, our, our relationship with God must go with us. And I, I remember some years back, the guy said it jokingly. I, I know he meant it as a joke. I used to go here. When he was going out the door that day, you know, he was trying to be funny. He said, I'll see you next week, God. I, I know what he meant, but how many times is that actually true? We leave, we leave what we believe right at the church, and I'll pick it up next Sunday. It must travel with us. I love when, when you read the Bible, if you, were, if you start reading as a whole and not grab some isolated verses, I love how it brings things together. God has a way of doing that. You know, he brings things together. Now, I'm going to touch on a few things here real quickly here. Now, stay with me. Now, I'm going somewhere. I know I like to talk a lot, but I am not going somewhere with this. All right. Now, the, uh, the chapter that we just read, 1 Corinthians 12, now, I'm going to give you a summary of it, what it means. Basically, that chapter uh, in... Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it talks about the gifts of the Spirit and what they are and where they come from. Okay, we know, we know what they, they list all these different gifts and where they come from is the Holy Spirit. So, okay, all right, if you were to jump down to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, I'm going to give you a summary of that real quick. I'm not going to read that to you. It talks about how these gifts need to be used. Because, see, you can have all the gifts in the Word if you're not using them correctly. You know what, so he... They, he go, takes the time to explain to us how they are to be used. How they are, are to be used. All right, now, I went, we went to chapter 12 and we went to chapter 14. Now, let's jump back in the middle here. Chapter 13, 1 Corinthians. Now, that 1 Corinthians, uh, chapter 13, that's a very well-known chapter. That's really, that's nicknamed the love chapter. I can't tell you how many times I've read that chapter or somebody requested it during a wedding. I would read that chapter during the wedding. But let's, let's, actually, uh, let's actually see what, exactly, what the, the Apostle Paul is getting at here. It, it's referring to these gifts again. The Apostle Paul is basically, I'm going to put this in layman's terms. To exercise the gifts we are given correctly, they must be done in love. Being used in any other way is not to use them the way God intended See, there's many people that have a lot of gifts. They have a lot of talent. But they're not using them in the correct way. 
It's, it's, you know, for whatever reason is, they're using it for the glory of themselves or for financial gain or whatever it may be. We've got to remember, we've got to do them in the right way. If you don't do these things in love, it's all for not. That ain't what I say. That's what the Bible says. We must remember that we are gifted by the Spirit. So to say you have no purpose is to say there is no God. Well, I would never say that, Pastor. God, God created you with a purpose, and He created you with a gift. Do you know what that purpose is? Do you know what your gift is? You should. You should. Many times, somebody else can see something in you that you can't see in yourself. I see many people, they have, they have, they have these gifts, but they have no confidence in themselves. Well, I can't do that. God gifted you. I am sure you. God is going to uh, uh, give you uh, many things and uh, help you work through all these things, I should say. But you've got to step forward into those opportunities. So to say you have no purpose or no gift, to say there is no God. God created you with a purpose and a gift. Whatever your purpose is, whatever your gift, God will not only equip you, He will give you opportunity. Amen. He gives you opportunity. Many times I've seen people just squander their life away. And then when opportunity comes, they say, I'm not ready for it. Why weren't you ready? Because you squandered your opportunity. The time that God was trying to prepare you for that opportunity to come, you just squandered it away. I didn't know what God had for me. But I always know this. I'm going to prepare the best I can because when an opportunity does arise, hopefully God can use me. I had no idea. You know, I had a young man that was getting into a, getting into a certain field of work. And I told him, you know, he, he was starting out completely from scratch. And I told him this, take everything they offer you, every class that they offer you, every whatever, seminar, whatever, take everything. Because regardless, you'll be able to use those life skills one day. It might not be at this job, but it might be somewhere else in life. They can't take that knowledge from you. In other words, when you're doing that, you're preparing for opportunities down the road. If you're not preparing, what are you preparing for? Failure. You're preparing for a life of, uh, you know, where you, know, you feel empty. You've got to prepare for those opportunities. It might be somewhere else for you. Many times we, we just look at the day ahead of us, you know, and I understand that. But you also have to prepare because you don't know what God has for you. In the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 12, verse 7, the one we read this morning, it says when talking about the gifts, it says, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one. But there's something we, we leave out in the rest of that sentence. It says, for the profit of all. Let me read that again. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. We think when the Spirit manifests, manifests itself in our life that it's just for our good. That God is doing a great thing. Yes, it is for our good, but it's for other people's good. The, the gift that God gives you, if you're not sharing it with somebody else, what good is that gift? That's no gift at all. When you, a gift is to be given to somebody else, right? <laughs> you know, maybe you're one of those people that just gives, gets gifts at Christmas and you don't give any. I don't know. I don't know. There's some people out here I'm sure like that. But that's really not, that's not much. That's not, what, what do you got going on there? If all you're going to do is receive, and you're not going to give anything out. There are far too many Christians, I, this is the term I come up with, that are spiritual porkers. <laughs> what, what is a porker when you think of a porker? You know, I think of a big, fat pig. You know what, you know why he's like that? Because he just takes in, and he takes in, and he takes in. Many Christians are like that. You take in and you take in and you take in, but you don't give anything back. That's not the way it was meant to be. That's not the way it's meant to be. God wants to do a work in you. But when he, after, when he's through, not, well, I shouldn't say through, but when he's doing that work in you, you're supposed, he wants to do something through you, right? So you've got to give it back out. You've got to give it back out. You know what? We become spiritually bloated. I, 
I, you know what I hear so many times? Oh, pastor, if we could do this or we could do that or whatever. I find most Christians already know more than they're ever going to use in this life. We want to keep gaining knowledge. I want to know more about this. I want to know more. Nothing wrong with gaining knowledge. Knowledge is good. But after a while, you've got to start applying it. You know more already than you're ever going to use, most likely. We've got to go out and make a difference in the world. Somebody made a difference in your life. Somebody did. Somewhere along the line, somebody made a difference. Might have been recently, it might have been many years ago, it might have been during your childhood. Somebody made a difference in your life. I don't know who that person is. Why don't you be that person for somebody else? And many times, you're going to affect people you don't think you affect. You're going to say, well, I can make no difference in nobody's life. <coughs> I tell you, some of the youth that I've taught over the last 20 years, Believe me, they just sit in there because I think their parents may have come. But I've seen some other ones that I had in my early days. I mean, they're in their middle 30s and late 30s now, those kids. Or men and women now. Now that I, I talk to them as they're grown and see things, they talk about the difference. You know what I mean? I, you know, I, like, I can't believe I'm hearing this. I said, this is the kid I thought was asleep all the time. <laughs> you know, this is the kid I thought, you know, was a... But they, they, as an adult, you know what I mean? You didn't realize how, what an impact you're having on their life. So don't, just because you don't think you're having an impact, don't mean, that means we're not supposed to try. God is trying to do something, I'm telling you. We've got to be receptive to it. There's opportunity out there. If you're born again, the, the Holy Spirit has already started a great work in you. Or are you just going to sit there and let all these opportunities go by? I do not want to sit at the end of my days and say, I wish I'd just give a little bit more effort. That's not what I'm going to be guilty of. I may be guilty in the end of my days for failing some. And not, you know, but I am not going to be sitting there at the end of my days and say, you know what? I wish I'd just tried a little bit harder. I wonder what God would have actually done in my life. No way. No way. I'm, I'm going to fail sometimes. But I'm going to try. It's not going to be because of a lack of effort on my part. It might be God said, this ain't the right time for it. You know what? I appreciate the effort, but this is not the right time for it. It's not the season for it. Put the effort in. I'm telling you, God will use you sooner or later. Put the effort in. You never know what difference you're going to make on the other side of eternity. Till we get there. Just like, I'm going to say it again. I just, that's the second time I've said it. Just like the video we just watched. A bar of soap and a rag made a difference in somebody's life. But yet we don't think we can make a difference. Think about this. We're all connected to God, people, through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a unifier, not a divider. Now I've met some people in church, I think they wanted to be divided. They wanted to be divided. Oh, pastor, let's do this. This group would do that. This group would do this. I said, no, we're going to do it together or we ain't doing it. Oh, I was on the bad list then. Oh, I got chewed up. Oh, I got chewed up. We're going to do it together if we ain't doing it at all. Because if I allow different groups to do different stuff like this, it's going to create division. That's all it's going to do. We're going to do it together or we ain't doing it at all. That's all right. I've been chewed up before. You can chew me up some more. That's all right. God, God can fill me up. Whatever they chew off of me. <laughs> some of the stuff, I don't know where I come up with it. I don't know. A lot of this stuff I say, it's not even in my notes. I don't even know where it comes from. God draws, think about this. As I said, God is a, is a unifier, not a divider. God draws all those pieces in our life, all those gifts, and don't forget all the broken pieces in our life. He brings us all together to form the church. The broken pieces, the, the pieces, and the gifts, and we wonder why churches look the way they look. Because, look, at we come into the church, we're broken, and we got things going on in our life. No wonder churches have problems, because we're people. We're in this world. There's always going to be, even born-again believers, sometimes we're just going to have problems. We're going to have issues. We've got to work through. That's why churches look the way they look, because they're full of people. <laughs> That's what it is. It's just full of people. So when you think you found a perfect church, it don't exist. Some of them are better at putting, you know, unless you really get into it, you don't see the problems or something. But every church has problems. I'm going to just say this, though. Everybody should be in a church. Everybody should be in a church. 
I am not uh, trying to recruit anybody to go to New Liberty. I'm saying you should be in a church jail somewhere. If you can't find a church, all these churches out here, every one of them got a problem. There might be a problem somewhere else. It might need to look in that mirror, right? Can you imagine God with all of our brokenness, all of our problems, each one of us, all the stuff we got? God tries to and he bring, bring that together, all that mess, and he makes something beautiful out of it. And all of our shortcomings, all of our mess, God makes something beautiful. But that's what God does. But that's, that's the things only God can do. We must function as one. We must function as one, as one. And how do you do that? Use your gifts. Put some effort in. You know, do your best. You know, it doesn't mean you're not going to fail at times. But sometimes we're not comfortable with what God has called us to. Why is that? Why are we not comfortable with what God called us to? Well, sometimes I've noticed, sometimes we want to be somebody else. We like somebody else's gift. I want to, I want to be like them. Well, you can't be like them. The church, Christians have to stop trying to be like everybody else. God created you unique. You've got to be your own person. Even though we all got little things going on.